I were to, if someone were to ask you, what's the main difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? What would you say? And if I took away, you can't answer what we believe about Jesus. As far as worldview goes, um, just culture, dress, behavior, what's the main difference, you think, between someone who follows Jesus and everyone else, or anyone else? It's easy to think something in our behavior would be the difference, maybe something in the way we talk, but that really can't be it, not that our behavior shouldn't change when we follow Jesus. It absolutely will. But if you think about this, the gospel says that when, when that person on skid row comes to believe in Jesus and their life is a complete mess, when they come to believe in Jesus, they are absolutely redeemed, rescued, saved by the blood of Christ. Now, their sanctification process by which their behavior starts to change will probably be gradual and slow like most growth. If you compared that person's behavior, language, habits to a very moral Hindu, a very moral Muslim, atheist, Mormon, Jew, we certainly wouldn't be able to say, well, the main difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is good behavior, because we'd probably pick the wrong one. I'm not positive on this. I could be wrong this morning. But after studying today's passage, I think the main difference between someone who follows Jesus and everyone else might be a difference in geography. Let's read today's passage. And we'll talk about why I think geography is the biggest difference between those of us who are pursuing Christ and anyone else Who's not? Philippians chapter 3 is where we start today. Verse 17, we're going to read 317 through 4 1. It's a pretty uh, unfortunate chapter break. The, the first verse of chapter 4 really goes with what we read today and not what we'll study next week, so it'll be thrown off there. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 17, Paul writes to his friends in Philippi this. He says, Brethren, join in following my example. And observe those who walk according to the patter, pattern you have seen in us. For many people walk, of whom I've often told you, and now I tell you, weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their appetite. And they glory in their shame. These are people who set their minds on earthly things. For or but, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. There's our passage. We are going to get to the, to the geography in the passage that makes a difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. But before we do, I think we have to pause at verse 17 and, and discuss something for a minute because... In verse 17, Paul says something that sounds incredibly prideful. He says, imitate me. What Paul says here does not come from a place of pride. It, comes, it actually comes from humility 
and love. And I don't want to talk about why that is. I think it's important for us to know. He says this to his friends, be imitators of me, everyone there in Philippi, brothers and sisters, and watch carefully people like me who live the way I've described and follow this example that you've seen in us. Now, would you ever say that to someone else? Would you ever say, you know what you ought to do? You ought to watch me really closely. And if you are more like me, like you'd be doing a lot better. Probably don't, you know, right? If you're thinking about it, if you do it, probably stop would be my, uh, would be my advice, my pastorly advice this morning. This seems really prideful to us, but it's not. We have to understand what pride is. Now, culturally, we probably shouldn't say this now, but this is actually humility and love from Paul and not pride. Here's why. Pride, first of all, if we define our terms, pride it starts from an exaggerated view of myself, positive or negative. Either I exaggerate the positive view of myself, and I want others to also agree with this exaggerated view of myself, or I can do that with my problems. I can exaggerate my problems and my pain, and nobody has it worse than me, and I want others to agree with how bad I've got it. Also pride, because pride ultimately is just self-focus. I focus on me, and I want others to focus on me. That's pride. Not what Paul's doing here. Humility, then, is having an accurate assessment of myself and then putting the interests of others ahead of my own interests. If that's humility, that's what Paul's doing. And Paul's coming out of love. Do you remember how we define love here? What's love? Love is when I want to see what God would say is best take hold in someone else's life. That's love. So Paul, we're going to talk about geography this morning, citizenship this morning. Paul's got his geography straight. Paul, and it's made all the difference in Paul's life. Do you remember where Paul is as he writes this letter? Where is Paul? He's in prison. He's on death row. They, he does not know that they might just come in and execute him. And he writes this letter that's all about joy. His circumstances don't sap his joy. They haven't touched his hope. And the difference is geography. This world is not Paul's home. Paul's not trying to live his best life now. That's made so much of a difference in Paul's life that it's something, it's a package with the gospel that Paul wants his friends to have. If Paul loves the Philippians, he wants them to have what he has. It's in their best interests that they have what he has. So out of humility and love, being others focused and wanting God's best done in his friend's life, he tells them, I want you to have what I have. Now, it seems prideful to us because we tend to confuse humility with modesty. And they're not the same thing. Modesty is when I cover up or downplay something that's actually here. Uh, the Bible talks about dressing modestly. The reason the word modesty is used there is because dressing modestly is covering up what's actually here, right? Immodesty would be accentuating or revealing what's actually here. That's why we use the word modesty to talk about that kind of dress. But just regular modesty in interpersonal relationships is when I cover up something, some talent, some ability, uh, some belief that I actually have, but I cover it up with things like, oh, that's nothing. Oh, anybody could do that. Oh, that was an accident. Oh, man, I'm really not. That, that's modesty. And that can be fine. 
that can be appropriate. But it's not humility. Humility is different. In fact, modesty, we can use modesty when we're coming from a place of pride. Our pride can make us modest. Happens all the time. Here's how. What is it that keeps me and you from sharing what we believe about Christ with other people? Isn't it the way they will think about us? Isn't that what stops us? Yes. So what we do is we cover up what's really here so that they will think more highly of us. We use modesty, covering up what's actually here from a place of pride because we want to be raised in their estimation. We want them to think we're kind of awesome. And if I don't cover, cover this up, they might not think I'm awesome. Right? So Paul, humility sometimes leads to boldness. That's what Paul does here. Paul says, I'm going to say something right here. Some people there might think I'm a jerk. But I have something that's so important, and I love you so much that I want to tell you to be like me in this area. Because Paul was humbly, boldly loving of the Philippians. Does that make sense? Okay. I said, okay, as if it did make sense. No one responded. I, act, I just, in my brain, all of you went, oh man, that was the best explanation I've ever heard in my life. My pride. See, I got it too. So Paul says, imitate me because, watch very closely, because I've got something, I've figured something out that when the Romans drag me away and put me on death row, they still can't get at my hope and my joy. And I want you to have that. And the difference is geography. And so next Paul's going to talk not about the, ge the good geography that he has. First he's going to talk about bad geography. In verses 18 and 19, Paul says most people have bad geography. They live with a bad sense of geography. He writes it this way. For many, this is most people, this is the overwhelming majority of human beings who have ever walked the earth. And Paul says, some of whom I've often told you about, I've talked with you about these people before. I, I have tears in my eyes while I write about them right now. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly or their appetites or their desires. They exult in their shame. They think about earthly things. I'll tell you why that's about geography in a second. First, I, I want you to know there's amongst Bible scholars and other uh, Christian nerds, there are, there's a debate about who Paul's talking about here. Paul has a group of people in mind. He doesn't identify them. He doesn't have to. Because this is a letter, and the people he's writing to know who he's talking about. Paul says, you know, those folks I've told you about over and over, I'm talking about them again. The Philippians know who that is. We don't, for sure. I'll tell you the two options that Bible nerds take. One is Paul is still talking about a group he mentioned up in verse 3 of this chapter that he, that he called dogs there, the false circumcision. The beginning of this chapter, Paul was talking about, be, be very careful of these, uh, I called them Judaizers. Here's, the Judaizers were, they're Jewish people who came, became convinced, hey, that Jesus guy was probably the, the Messiah that God promised. But, they believe we still have to, he's going to be the king. We're dependent on that. They still believe we have to behave our way into God's good graces. They deny that the way to be uh, rescued by God is through faith in Christ alone. They believe we, you have to take on the whole law, do the whole law. The good's got to outweigh the bad. And if you're good enough, God will accept you. 
Paul refutes these guys over and over and over in his letters. It's what makes him the angriest. Option A is that's who Paul's ta still talking about in the near context that makes the most sense like grammatically. But there are others who think Paul is talking about another group of people that apparently he's always talked about with the Philippians. And I'll call them uh, the licentious people. Licentiousness is living with this idea that Jesus went to the cross and, oh, I understand, I get rescued, forgiven by God through faith in Christ, and that sort of gives me a license to sin because now God has to forgive me no matter what I do. Salvation's by faith alone. So now I can just wait. I've got my ticket to heaven, and I can just go living for my for my lust, by my belly, by my desires. I can chase whatever I want to down here, live it up, and I know he has to forgive me anyway. That is licentious living. What does Paul always say about that idea? May it never be, or no way. So who's Paul talking about? I won't be dogmatic about either way. Here's, here's my, my take on this. I think this is what's called a divine omission. I don't think Paul identified this group because God didn't want Paul to identify this group, and I don't think it matters because they both fit extremely well what Paul says. I'll show you how. The licentious person, the grace user, that person who thinks, hey, I'm forgiven anyway, so I can do whatever I want and just live according to my own lust. Paul might be saying about a person like that, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That seems harsh. Why would licentious living make me an enemy of the cross of Christ? Because I am living as if the reason Christ went to the cross was to allow me to sin without worry. It's a denigration of the cross of Christ. It's not why he went. He went there to save me from that stuff that I'm reveling in and celebrating. Paul says that makes you an enemy of the cross of Christ. Paul says their end is destruction. More on that one in a moment. Their God is the belly, their appetites. They just live uh, for whatever feels good in the moment, whatever excitement, whatever um, they desire, and they wind up exulting in stuff they ought to be ashamed of. But this also fits with the, with the Judaizer, with the legalist, the person who thinks, I can be more in God's eyes by the way I behave. Paul refutes that because we have our position before God as Christians through Jesus' behavior and not ours, right? So Paul might be saying of those dogs, the legalists, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. How does legalism make someone an enemy of the cross of Christ? Well, if, if someone isn't an extreme legalist, which would just be every religion in the world except for biblical Christianity, every religion in the world is some system by which we try to be good enough that whatever higher power is out there will, will give us a better life after our death than the one we have now. That, that's every religion in the world, right? Even if it's Judaism, living by the law God gave, that makes us an enemy of the cross of Christ. Because that is extreme. We're saying, I don't need the cross of Christ. I can be good enough on my own. But even if I'm a Christian, I can be an enemy of the cross of Christ when I, when I feel like this. That person on Skid Row I mentioned a minute ago, that, uh, that addict who pays for her addiction through prostitution, who comes to know Jesus as Savior, and someone says, man, 
before God, she is just as righteous as you. Our legalist has a really hard time with that. We chafe at that idea. That makes us an enemy of the cross of Christ because we denigrate the power of the blood of Jesus. Paul might be saying, if he's still talking about the legalists, their end is destruction. Hold on to that. Their God is their belly. The legalist still has desires in his flesh or her flesh that is running the show of their life. They're just different than the licentious person. They may not have a desire for, uh, you know, for immor abjectly immoral things. They may not be addicted to anything. They may be so self-disciplined they never touch anything like that. They don't sleep around. They don't do any of that stuff. But their desire is still to be better. It always feels better to feel better than others. They might desire to be in control. They might desire to have other people look at them and think, wow, he or she really has all their stuff together. They might have a desire for other people to look at me with admiration. And Paul would say, man, they're exulting in their shame because they're measly little righteousness. The righteousness of their own, as Paul calls it. Just as well be a pile of filthy, say the word, a pile of filthy rags before God. That's what we're exulting in. And no matter who he's talking about, Paul says they're in is destruction. Anybody on any, we'll put the, uh, the, li the licentious person here, the, the legalist clear over here, anyone on that spectrum, their end is going to be destruction. On the extremes, if they don't come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, eternal destruction awaits. But even Christians who are redeemed and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, who use grace, who use grace, who tend toward legalism, our end is still going to be destruction even if we live forever. And here's why. Here's the key to this whole thing. Here's the geography part. Here's the problem with both camps. They think about earthly things. They think about earthly things. You see, that's what turns one person into a licentious person and another person into a legalist. They think about earthly things. The licentious person who lives like he has a license to sin, why do I get started in those things? Because I think about earthly things. I just want the next thing that will make me feel excited, that will make me feel better, that whatever it is will make me feel desirable. Whatever it is, I think about earthly things. The legalist still thinks about earthly things. How do I make other people admire me? All my have-it-togetheredness, I want that to show. I want to be better. I want to be in control. How about the person somewhere in the middle who just, I want to be good, but I still want what I want through success, through money, through whatever it is. Eventually, the end of that is going to be destruction. And here's how. Even if I'm a saved person, because every single one of us is going to stand before what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And if we're Christians, the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment where you find out whether you go to heaven or go to hell. If you find yourself before the judgment seat of Christ, you have eternal life, signed, sealed, and delivered at the cross. But Jesus is going to judge all of us to see what we did with this one life that was invested in eternity. And when we think about earthly things, it will turn into licentiousness. It might turn into legalism, but it will all be kindling and worm food in the end. It will be destroyed. It will be for nothing. We will have wasted 
our lives. And the problem is geography. Our mental geography. The problem is they think about earthly things, but not us. No, sir. This is not supposed to describe us. Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. You see the contrast there? The rest of the world is stuck thinking about earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform these humble bodies of ours into the likeness of His glorious body by means of that power with, with, with which He's able to subject all uh, of the powers of this earth to himself and so then loved ones live this way do you hear the main difference between a Christian and a non-Christian there that I'm talking about it's our citizenship notice the tense that Paul starts verse 20 in the tense of the verbs Paul doesn't say but not us we're trying really hard to be good so that someday we can be citizens of heaven if God lets us in when we get there. It's not what he says. He says our citizenship is already in heaven. We, we're living there. It's like when you go on vacation, if you travel overseas for vacation, you, know, you probably don't apply for many jobs while you're over there. You didn't spend your time doing that. Why? You're not trying to put down roots. It's not your home. Right? Just because you're someplace else, you're still an American with a real home where you're invested. Paul says, that's us right now. Our citizenship is in heaven. Next, Paul says, and we're also awaiting a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we're already citizens of heaven, but we're still awaiting our rescue. We're, we're, we're awaiting being saved. Like we're already saved, but we're not yet saved, right? I want to say a couple things about us waiting for our Savior from heaven. First, I just want to say this. This is Paul's major point. Jesus Christ is coming back to this planet. He will return. Paul says we're, we're awaiting a Savior from there. That's what we're waiting on. He's coming back. It is the clear uh, testimony of the entire New Testament, every author and every book. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. And that's what we're waiting on. That is the main thing you and I, if we are following Jesus, that's the main thing we are waiting on more than we're waiting on anything else. Our Savior from there. If that's true about us, do you know how different that makes us? Now, that prostitute on Skid Row who gets saved and starts to understand that she can be waiting for her Savior from there. The very moral Hindu never will be. There's the difference. What we're waiting on is our Savior from there. Do you know how different that makes us from, honestly, most of what passes as Christianity in the world today, in America today, for sure. Most of what is called Christianity, which I don't think is Christianity, does not teach that the main thing we are waiting on is our Savior to get back here someday and save us from all this. Most of what passes as Christianity purports to teach us how to use God to get our circumstances, fi circumstances fixed down here. How we can claim healing. We can claim prosperity. 
and really the only problem with that idea is the entire Bible. Right? Where's Paul as he writes this? He's in prison on death row. And he doesn't say, I'm claiming my freedom. He says, I'm waiting on my Savior from there. And they can't take that away from me. That's why I have this hope and this joy. Here's another example, though, of where I see us, and I mean us, getting off of what we're supposed to be waiting on. We're not waiting on God to fix our temporary circumstances as much as we're waiting on a Savior to fix the, the world. But here's another thing. Which I, this is growing in popularity out here where we live. We can get, it's very easy to get so fixated on the Antichrist, the one world government, um, the evils of our society. And how all of that is predicting how that's going to fall into place. And oh, here's this news story. And see, that means we're getting real close and the Antichrist is coming. And I think I know who he or she is. Used to be Hillary, now it's Joe Biden. <laughs> right? You only laugh because it's true. Um, right? We get so fixated on that stuff. Folks, can I just, we're not waiting on the Antichrist. We're waiting on Jesus Christ. We're, we're not supposed to be drawing up our battle plans and our survival modes. We're not supposed to be seeing how we can fight against the evil one world system to keep society from sliding over the edge into the abyss. It's going. It's going. We are deteriorating right on schedule. Our job is to be in that society knowing we're not going into the abyss. We're awaiting a Savior from there. And we have the only thing that anyone can latch on to that gives them the hope that we have. And that's why we're not waiting on the Antichrist. People have been trying to put the clues together for 2,000 years, and every single one of them has been wrong. It gets us off of our purpose. Paul tells us some things that the Savior will do when he comes back. This is so awesome. About the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, he will transform these humble bodies of ours into the likeness of his glorious body. Now, just according to verse 21, who is it that's going to transform our bodies into glorified bodies? Who's going to do that? Jesus. Good answer. Great job. If you just always shout that answer out, you'll be right most of the time. We won't do it for time's sake, but if we went elsewhere in the New Testament, if we went elsewhere in the Bible, guess who it is, who we will read is going to do that transforming work? God. So who's going to do it? God or Jesus Christ? Yes. How can both of those things be true? Only if Jesus Christ is fully God, and he is. But look what he's going to do. He is going to take the power by which he is able to subject all things to himself. This is going to be so awesome. This is one thing we're waiting on. When he comes back, do you know what he's going to do with that, with that society that's sliding toward the abyss? With those evil governments, with those leaders that you don't like and I don't like? Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to crush them with a righteous vengeance. And subject all things to himself. When we think we are going to thwart the plans of the Antichrist, we have brought the tiniest knife to the biggest gunfight. We're awaiting a Savior to do what only he can do. Does it take a lot of power to subject all of the powers of this earth? A lot of power. 
A lot of men have tried. They've all failed. He won. Does that take a lot of power? Okay, check this out. That's not even Paul's main point. Paul says all that power that he's going to use to subject all the powers of the earth to himself, he's going to take that power and use that power to change you. He's going to take all that power he's going to use to crush all the powers of the earth and change me into who I've always wanted to be and way more than I could ever imagine. That's what we're waiting on. You know, I think the allure of addictive substances, of drugs and alcohol that people get so wrapped up in, I think a lot of the, the draw to that is because we want to be changed. I don't want to feel like this anymore. I want to forget what's back there. I want to forget what's around here. I want to feel excited and better. In some ways, that's a good desire. You just have to wait for the one who's going to do it right. He is coming, and he's going to take all of the power that he can use to subject all the powers of the earth, and he's going to change you. And he is going to change me. So then, my brothers and sisters, my dear friends whom I long to see because I'm locked up in prison. Paul calls them my joy and my crown. Here's another difference between us and them. If we're following Jesus, we have our geography straight. We're waiting on our rescue from there. We're living for that life and not this one. This life is short. Eternity is long. Which one would you prefer to invest in? When we live that way, people who live with their eyes on the world down here, stuff down here becomes their joy and their crown. Their accomplishments, their monies, the next party, whatever it is. People become our joy and our crown when we live for there because that's the only thing we will have to show for our time down here. Things we did for other people in the name of Jesus Christ. For Paul, because he was a church planter and a missionary, he tells the Philippians, you are my joy and crown. You can't take it with you, but I can take you with you. That's what Paul says. You are going to be there, and that's what I rejoice in. So, you see how maybe the biggest difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is, is geography. It's citizenship. It's where do you live? Where is your heart? Where do you want your best life? Here and now or there and then? This is so similar to what Paul's been talking about. Last week we talked about pursuing maturity. And I said, if you think about it, all of our sins can be, can be boiled down to a loss in our maturity because the mature Christian is pressing toward that relationship. Now Paul says, if you want to live like me, make sure you're living for that day, that citizenship, that world. All of our sins are a citizenship problem, our geography problem, where suddenly we've started to live for things that are here and now, right? When we do things for him, for the Lord, like Paul, we will come to the end of our lives and realize we have not wasted. We have not wasted our one life on stuff that didn't matter. We've been citizens of heaven all along. We've been living for the home front all along. And again, Paul just says, he said at the very beginning, follow me. Paul said, find somebody who lives this way and follow his example. And that's going to bring us to this table. 
So let me pray for us, and we're going to pause with that thought. We're going to follow the right example of a real citizen of heaven. Let's pray while we transition. Our Father, I am so thankful that we have something worth waiting on, waiting for us. Because you have a plan, and you've told us enough about the plan that we can depend on the plan. And what we learned this morning is this. The Lord Jesus is coming back. He's going to take us to be with him. He's going to make us like him. He's going to change us. And we are already citizens of heaven. God, change our mental geography. Help us to live for our real home. Help us more and more to take our eyes off of the here and now. Put our eyes and our hearts on the there and then. And as we gather around the table this morning, Lord, I pray that you would commune with us as we follow the example of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. As we start our time of communion, I was thinking of Hebrews 12, too, because it reminded me of today's passage where Paul said, follow me. Elsewhere, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The author of Hebrews said this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right uh, at the right hand of the throne of God. If Paul would encourage us to, to imitate Paul, Paul would also encourage us to imitate Paul as Paul imitated Jesus. Think about, did Jesus do today's passage well? Paul said, the people who are doing it wrong just live their lives for the here and now, for not being citizens of heaven. Jesus Christ was not just a citizen of heaven. He was its king. And it was the joy set before him that allowed him to endure all of his circumstances. He is our example. And so as we remember the cross, as the bread comes around, and, and we're going to sing. If, if you'd like to sing along, please sing with us. If you just want to take some time with the Lord and, and, and remember him and remember the price he paid to guarantee your home. Consider the example that was Christ. Set your eyes on the joy set before you, like the Lord Jesus did as the guys come forward. I'll pray. Father God, thank you for the symbols of your body and your blood, the bread and the fruit of the vine. God, we remember what you did how you set your sights, Lord Jesus, on heaven and on rescuing us. Thank you for your humility and your love and for the price you paid to make us citizens of your kingdom. And we pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.